On the phone, it's a pleasure to welcome back to this program, Professor, University of Michigan, uh, proprietor of the blog Informed Comment at wancole.com. Uh, Professor Cole, welcome to the program. Thanks, Sam. Uh, so catch us up on uh, yesterday, the election for presidency in Egypt, I guess, was certified or announced. Uh, maybe that's the same thing. Uh, and the... Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood candidate won. Take us back to uh, how we got here in terms of the runoff and what has happened uh, in regards to uh, Parliament since then and then where we go forward. So uh, w- w- the runoff was in June. Right. Uh, the uh, I'd like to start even earlier. You know, Please. we had the Arab Spring. We had the big mass crowds in Tahrir a year and a half ago. And you had a lot of young people, mostly left of center, uh, using Twitter and Facebook, and uh, they they got rid of uh, the uh, long-running president, uh, Hosni Mubarak, uh, who who was a dictator. And their demand was that you go to uh, elections. So uh, they had a national referendum, and they elected a parliament uh, last uh, uh, December, But it turns out that those young people who were left of center, relatively secular, who got rid of Mubarak, weren't very good at canvassing or organizing political parties. And who was good at that was uh, a longstanding group in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood, who are religious fundamentalists. And they took over parliament. And so... uh, And then you went... Okay. Yes. Uh, give us a sense of uh, maybe we should just start at that point w- with the players because we have um, these young people who really joined together. It seems to me with uh, labor in many respects because there was a lot of uh, labor strikes uh, in the right. year, year and a half uh, leading up to Tahir Square, um, and uh, so there was sort of a uh, there there was there was a lot of. In addition for, I think, a, a desire for greater democracy, essentially, uh, in Egypt, there was also a, a lot of economic dissent uh, that seemed to be going uh, on at the time. And the Muslim Brotherhood did not play a huge role, or at least they didn't really enter into a huge role in what was happening into here until, until uh, very late in the, in the, uh, in the protest. Is that right? Absolutely right, Sam. You, you put your finger on it. Uh, those uh, young people who were protesting were allied with uh, labor uh, movements, uh, textile workers, even office workers, uh, many of them working for state uh, enterprises, because Egypt's public sector is enormous, and uh, who were increasingly badly paid and badly treated. Uh, so this was, uh, this was a left labor movement originally. And the Brotherhood, you know, is all of, as with the religious right in a lot of societies, it's, it's all about private property and business and so forth. So they, they really weren't very interested in that aspect. Uh, they, they wanted to get rid of Mubarak, but they were junior partners in the revolution. But then they took over parliament, and uh, then they went to presidential elections. And uh, in the first round of the presidential elections, actually the, the labor left got about a fifth of the votes, uh, but the two top candidates ended up being the Muslim Brotherhood candidate, Mohamed Morsi, uh, and uh, Ahmed Shafiq, uh, an Air Force, uh, former Air Force general who had been uh, in Mubarak's cabinet, was aviation minister, and then was his last prime minister. So he kind of was a revenge of the old regime. Uh, they were back, and they were, they were in contestation, and they did pretty well in the, uh, in the first round. So uh, the big question was, was Egypt going to go back to having a general, as uh, a former general, as a, prime, as a president? Uh, would he reinstitute the, uh, the secret police, uh, the crackdowns on demonstrations, authoritarianism, which is how he talked? Uh, or would you have a Muslim Brotherhood president? Uh, he at least was against the old regime, but he wants to put in uh, strict Islamic law, uh, liberal women are afraid of him. Coptic Christians are afraid of him. So it was a really unfortunate choice that the poor Egyptians had to make, uh, given the ideals of their original revolution. And in the end, it came down 
uh, on the side of the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, it really is not a coincidence in some respects because, um, like you say, the the Muslim Brotherhood has been uh, in Egypt, and and for much of that time was uh, was I guess vaguely outlawed or at least as a, a political entity. Um, uh, but they've been there for 80 some odd years. So they had some type of organizational structure. And presumably, if you come from the military, uh, the, uh, the, the Supreme Council of Armed Forces, the, uh, the military there, they, they are a massive bureaucracy. Much of, uh, they have their own sort of uh, industries uh, that they own there as well. So they, they are already sort of pre-organized before any of this happens? Oh, yeah. Well, the military is very well organized, but also uh, Hosni Mubarak, the dictator, had developed a political party, the National Democratic Party. Uh, it wasn't national, it wasn't democratic, but it uh, nevertheless uh, was a kind of uh, dominant party in, in Egypt. And Mubarak used to have these phony parliamentary elections in which his party would always massively win. But he let the Muslim Brotherhood participate. And so they've kind of been having, you know, uh, trial runs for par for parliamentary elections. They just, uh, you know, uh, didn't really count the ballots at the end, but they had the campaigns and so forth. But the military, just before the presidential election, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, not the military, but the Supreme Court uh, struck down the parliament. They said it was elected illegally uh, and dissolved it. So uh, as you went into the presidential election, you didn't have a parliament anymore. That may have angered people and caused them to vote against the, the establishment candidate and for the Muslim brother, uh, Morsi. Um, but now you've got a president. He's been elected, but he has no parliament. And they're saying they'll go to parliamentary elections again uh, at the end of this year. Uh, there's no constitution because parliament uh, uh, dawdled and, and didn't get uh, a constitutional assembly together in time to write one. So it's not clear what powers the president has. And then the military issued a kind of its own constitution, which limited the powers of the president until a new constitution was written and made sure that the president uh, wasn't uh, the commander in chief of the armed forces because they didn't want him to be the boss of them. So, yes, he's been elected president, but it's not clear that he has any power. It characterized for me uh, the, the Supreme Court ruling that essentially invalidated the elections of, uh, of the parliament and, and effectively dissolved it. Um, was that a, I mean, do, do, is, it, is it perceived as a legitimate ruling in Egypt? Is it uh, perceived by you as an observer as a legitimate ruling? Was this one that the uh, the military had a hand in? What, what how would you um, how would you characterize that decision? Well, the substantive basis for the ruling uh, is actually probably legitimate, which is that uh, in the referendum of last year as they set the rules for the uh, uh, parliamentary elections, they set aside one-third of the seats for independents because they were aware that Mubarak's old party and the Muslim Brotherhood uh, had the experience in canvassing, and they might well end up dominating the new body. So they, didn't, they, didn't, they wanted to, uh, to throw a curveball into that whole process, so they said one-third of the seats will be for independents. But actually, the Muslim Brotherhood and the, the even more fundamentalist Salafi newer party uh, put up party candidates for the independent seats, and they won, of course. Uh, so the Supreme Court said, well, that was wrong. You weren't, you weren't supposed to you know, have party backing for the independent candidates. Uh, and they, the Supreme Court ruled that it invalidated the entire body. So actually, there isn't a lot of uh, dissent that the Supreme Court ruling was correct or that it had the right to make this ruling or that, you know, the grounds of it were incorrect. But what the Brotherhood says is that uh, you could find that those one-third of seats had been improperly elected, uh, but you, the, the Supreme Court isn't an executive body, and it shouldn't have gone on to order the dissolution of Parliament. There are lots of ways you could have dealt with that. You could have a do-over for that one-third of seats. And they felt like the, the Supreme Court should have waited for the new president to decide what to do about uh, the illegality of that part of the election. Um, 
so that's the basis on which the ruling is now being challenged, actually, and uh, uh, being reviewed. Uh, but it seems to me uh, and to a lot of people that probably there were consultations between the Supreme Court and the Military Council, uh, because imagine if if the if the fundamentalist parliament were still there with the religious right in control of it, and then Morsi becomes president, then all of a sudden they can pass legislation, he can sign it into law, they can redo Egypt in a fundamentalist direction without any let or hindrance. Uh, and so I think getting rid of that parliament was uh, intended to, to put the brakes on the on this this move towards fundamentalism. And, and so let's 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 talk about that uh, move towards fundamentalism. How much how uh, how fundamental uh, are we talking here? And, um, and and to what extent is there? I mean, this is the first time a. Um, I guess a, a Muslim fundamentalist uh, president has been elected as a Muslim fundamentalist president. Is that is that not correct? That's absolutely right. Actually, it's the first time a civilian has been free and fairly elected as president of Egypt. Uh, so the presidency uh, uh, developed under the old military dictatorship, which was, you know, kind of uh, left leaning, and uh, originally it had been socialist, and uh, and and uh, was a military uh, rule, and the the generals uh, didn't really care too much for um, the niceties of religious law, uh, and they were more interested in almost a Soviet model of development. So to have uh, the and, and the Muslim Brotherhood back in the fifties and sixties was was banned. They had tried to assassinate uh, uh, the, the the dictator Gamal Abdel Nasser. And so he put them in jail. Uh, so uh, they got back out of jail in the in the seventies with an agreement not to commit violence again, and which they have uh, they have uh, uh, adhered to. Uh, and so they've been uh, playing at parliamentary politics at the margins as best they could under the old Mubarak regime. But now they've emerged uh, as a major political force in Egypt, as the religious right is in control. And if you know, for an American audience, uh, it's not an exact analogy, and it's not meant as an insult. But they're kind of like the Tea Party, and just as the Tea Party more or less took over the House of Representatives in 2010, uh, so so the Muslim Brotherhood is ascendant, and they have a religious agenda, uh, in the same way the Tea Party is very much about uh, outlawing abortion, if they possibly could, on religious grounds. Uh, so the Brotherhood has a set of religious laws coming from Islam that they would like to implement. The problem is, you know, some of them would include, for instance, banning alcohol. But if you ban alcohol, who's going to go on vacation to Egypt? And you sit around the pool and, and drink fruit juice, uh, and then they want to ban bikinis and maybe even swimming wear altogether. And uh, Egypt depends very heavily on European tourists. About a third of them come from the Old East Bloc, uh, but uh, uh, they, they come in the millions, and they spend a lot of this is worth billions to the Egyptian economy. So a lot of people are afraid that the Muslim Brotherhood, if they put in these religious strictures, they're going to kill the tourism industry. So, um, so uh, what happens next? I mean, how uh, it's it's a it seems to me the next step is um, new parliamentary uh, elections. And do you anticipate, because of those fears you've just articulated, that um, that they, the Muslim Brotherhood and other, I guess, uh, fundamentalist Muslim um, political entities will have a tough time getting majority uh, in, in parliament? Uh, because now you have essentially all of the secularists lined up um, amongst, are, are not as, as divided as they might have been? Yeah, well, I, I, you know, what happened uh, after the fundamentalists took over parliament is I think there was reaction against that among a lot of Egyptians. They had wanted to vote against Mubarak, but I think they were kind of surprised at how far they had gone with themselves. So uh, in the first round of the presidential elections, actually, you you had a wide range of, uh, of political views. Hamdin Sabahi is a, is a socialist uh, labor activist, and he got about a fifth of the vote. And the labor unions in places like Alexandria 
uh, a big uh, Mediterranean city, came out for him, and he won it. And that had been a place where the Muslim Brotherhood and the fundamentalists had done very well in the parliamentary elections. Uh, and then you had basically, you know, uh, Western-style liberal candidates, uh, Mus- uh, Amr Musa, uh, who had been uh, Secretary General of the Arab League. Uh, you had kind of liberal-leaning Muslims who, you know, like religion and Islam, but they don't want to go too far in the direction of fundamentalism. So the, 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 each of these candidates got, you know, between a, 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 a tenth and a, and a fifth of the of the vote, and it suggests to me that if you go to new parliamentary elections uh, as the military wants to, uh, that the resulting parliament this time may well be much more diverse, and the brotherhood might might be reduced to you know a third or a fourth of it. I mean, when you talk about those three candidates in particular, um, uh, well, the labor left and um, the uh, Amu Musa, the uh, the sort of the the more traditional liberals. Um, you're talking their 30 percent of the vote. That would have been enough for them to come in first place in the in the uh, in the in the first essentially the primary, I guess. Um, oh yeah, and absolutely. If the, if the left and the liberals had had uh, colluded and people had dropped out, uh, they you might well right now have a left liberal president of Egypt. Yeah. Are there a lot of recriminations on the ground about that? I mean, are uh, because you know I, I guess it's easy for I mean. When you draw, just for the the sake of our understanding, a an analogy between the um, the Muslim fundamentalists in uh, in the Muslim Brotherhood and the Christian fundamentalists in this country, you know, to me that's a fairly apocalyptic, <laughs> uh, no pun intended, <laughs> a fairly apocalyptic uh, scenario. Is is there? I mean, is there? widespread uh, 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 despair, or is there just sort of mild concern? Is there a sense that, electorally speaking, uh, the parliament... Uh, in other words, is there a genuine concern that maybe this becomes a sort of a, a Saudi-style um, uh, uh, country, where um, uh, is there a concern that it becomes even more authoritarian? I mean, what is the general sense amongst the Egyptian people as to the prospects for the future, both to have a democracy and to have a fairly liberal-style democracy? Yeah. Well, I don't think there are a lot of recriminations, because everything has come as a surprise. Uh, everybody was surprised when the left uh, uh, candidate, uh, Hamdine Sabahi, did so well in the presidential uh, first round of the presidential elections. Uh, and I think what has happened is, first of all, the real issue in Egypt, Sam, what was not about uh, uh, fundamentalism versus secularism. It was about the old regime and, and, and democracy. And, and people were so afraid that the old regime is going to come back, that they'll bring back the secret police, and people will be arrested in the middle of the night and tortured, uh, that they'll clamp down on the newspapers, that's the, that was the real issue. And the reason that, that, that Morsi won in the end is that they were, they were convinced that at least, you know, he was in jail under Mubarak. He would understand about the evilness of the secret police. That's their hope. So uh, they're still in that stage where they're just trying to make sure the old regime doesn't come back. But I think in the next parliamentary elections, you're right. Uh, that, uh, you know, those young people who were very good at staging demonstrations but not very good at walking neighborhoods and getting out the vote, they're forming political parties now, and uh, they're talking about running for parliament. And I think it's just a learning curve. And, and the amazing thing is Egyptians are so philosophical about this. I, talk, I was in Egypt in May for a couple of weeks, and I went around talking to lots of people, and, and, and all of them said, well, you know, uh, Whoever gets in right now, uh, they'll be in for at most four years. And then if we don't like them, we'll throw the rascals out. They said we never were able to do that with Mubarak. He was there for life, and his son was going to come in after him. We were stuck. Now we're not stuck anymore. So whoever gets in, it's not so bad. You know, we'll just uh, have another election. You know, it's interesting because uh, I, the to the extent that I heard people prognosticating about this yesterday, uh, there seemed to be uh, far more sort of despair or concern 
then I am hearing, uh, n- not necessarily that you should be expressing uh, concern or despair or in any way, but it's y- you're, you're presenting a more optimistic picture. I mean, yesterday I heard people saying, you know, the Arab Spring is over, the reformers have failed uh, in many respects, and uh, my sense I'm getting from you is that th- there is a perception, even regardless of the fact that the, the military has sort of uh, put an asterisk next to the title uh, president, um, that and the the dissolution of the parliament. That there's a uh, there's a sense, anyways, that the revolution worked in some respects, and now there, it's going to simply take time for the the true reflection of the will of the Egyptian people will be reflected in election results because they're emerging from a 40-year period where there was only very few groups that that had the capacity uh, to organize. That's right. I, I, I think the, the Egyptian public in general is much more sanguine about uh, these matters than, uh, than what you may hear in the Western press. There's a lot of hysteria about the Muslim Brotherhood in particular, and, and you know, for reasons I understand, but uh, and there's some hysteria in Egypt as well, but but on the whole and by and large, look, you know, Morsi, uh, the, the fundamentalist uh, president, has promised to appoint a prime minister, and it, the, the Egyptian system is like the French system. You have a president, you have a prime minister, you have a cabinet. So Morsi has promised to, to appoint a non-fundamentalist prime minister, and there's talk about him putting some of the... Uh, um, uh, the other political forces in the cabinet. So, you know, the, the labor left did so well in the uh, first round of the presidential elections, maybe they'll get uh, the, the labor cabinet seat. Uh, and so his cabinet, his government that he's going to form, may actually kind of look like Egypt. Uh, and uh, a lot of people are, are, are hoping that, that uh, you know, he'll be more pluralist uh, than, uh, than hardline fundamentalist. And that's the way at least he has talked and, and, and the promises that he has made. Uh, and then, um, you know, if the military had said there simply isn't going to be uh, any further parliamentary elections, people, I think, would be very angry and you'd have another revolution. But all they said was, well, we'll have another round, you know, after the Constitution is written uh, uh, later this year. And uh, as I said, the Egyptians view elections as a way of correcting past mistakes, uh, so um, the Brotherhood is angry about uh, the dissolution of Parliament, but a lot of Egyptians say, well, okay, we'll have another pro- parliamentary elections, we'll try and fix what was wrong the last time, and uh, we'll go on. Uh, who will be, uh, how will they be drafting this Constitution? Who will, who will have a hand in it, and what will be uh, their agendas? In other words, are we going to see a Constitution that is designed to uh, benefit one group or another, one political uh, entity or interest or another? How much will the military have their uh, thumbs on these scales? Um, What can you tell us about that process? Right. Well, one of the reasons that the Brotherhood lost so much popularity and exposed itself to having Parliament dissolved was that it became grabby. And uh, they, they, the parliament was supposed to appoint 100 members of a, a constituent assembly to write the new constitution. And uh, gradually the Brotherhood tried to take over that process and uh, to, have, uh, to have itself write the constitution. Basically, it would be a Muslim Brotherhood constitution. And uh, that went to the courts, and the courts struck it down. They said, no, the constituent assembly has to look like e- Egypt. It has to have women on it and Coptic Christians. And, you know, you can't have a dominance of the Muslim Brotherhood. Just because they won one election one time, they can't shape the country forever. So uh, they struck down that constituent assembly. And so Parliament went back to the drawing board, and they tried to come up with a formula, and, and they appointed a new assembly. Well, now that Parliament has been dissolved, the military says it's going to appoint yet another constitutional assembly, uh, and presumably along the lines that the Supreme Court instructed, uh, that it would have pre- representation from all sectors of Egyptian society. The old constituent assembly that Parliament had appointed is still in session, and they say, well, we're going to go on meeting until we're formally dissolved, 
And the, the new assembly, if, there, if one is appointed, can pick up from where we have left off. But the long and the short of it is that one way or another, uh, no, the fundamentalists are not going to get to dictate the Constitution to the rest of Egyptian society. Uh, it's going to be a much more moderate document than that. And my suspicion is, you know, there is a 1971 Constitution, which has a lot of good things in it, but which were ignored, is that uh, uh, the new Constitution will look an awfully lot like the old Constitution. It'll just be tweaked here and there. Uh, characterize uh, the military uh, in your sense in terms of being a, a fairly, I mean, you know, to what extent are they a, a fair arbiter, uh, you know, in terms of, of representing a pluralistic uh, uh, Egypt going forward? I mean, they, uh, they obviously unilaterally uh, rewrote the definition of president, I guess, uh, which is seems problematic. How, uh, wh what are where are their interests? Well, the reason they re rewrote the definition of president was because there's not a new constitution, and under the old constitution, the president was a dictator. So they didn't want Morsi to come in and be a dictator. Mm -hmm. And you know, for instance, the, in the old constitution, the president appoints the officer corps. Well, what if he just fired them all and put in his guys? And you have a lot of Muslim brother generals. Uh, they don't want that. So um, they want a constitution uh, before they let him have the full powers of presidency, whatever the constitution dictates those be. The, the military, the officer corps, uh, is not a, a fair arbiter, obviously. They, they uh, have an animus against the fundamentalists. Uh, they used to put them in jail and, and uh, try to curb them and so forth. They're not, they're not religious people on the whole. And uh, so they support, I mean, the secular business classes are, you know, in tight with the military. Uh, in American terms, you have to think about them as, as the Republican Party. Uh, and uh, but, no, that doesn't work either because our Republican Party went fundamentalist. Mm. I don't know what you would say. Like the, the old the timey scholars, Republican maybe. Party, yeah, the old timey Republican, the, the the kind of log cabin Republicans or whatever. Well, but um, I think you, yeah, no, I wouldn't say log cabin uh, Republicans. Yeah. Probably like the Rockefeller Republicans, maybe. Right, right. They're they're in tight with the old business classes, with the secular business classes. Right. Uh, so they um, uh, they probably would be uh, fair to Copts and to women. And, and, and the, for the, the, the Constituent Assembly that the military appointed uh, probably would be a, a, a relatively representative body. And remember that the Supreme Court has already ruled that it has to be. So the military uh, has guidelines from the Supreme Court, which I think it would follow. Uh, so, I mean, in, in a way, it, it, the, the military is acting in a high-handed way. The courts are acting in a high-handed way. Uh, the Carter Center has condemned these uh, moves that have been made, and, and any you know, civil libertarian would be very concerned about these things that have been done. You don't want to invalidate the votes of millions of people by dissolving parliament uh, and so forth. But on the other hand, given that the Brotherhood was acting so grabby and, and arrogant and trying to take over everything uh, on the basis of having won one election, uh, the, the military and the courts are functioning uh, uh, in an arbitrary way as a kind of check and balance. And it's possible that Egypt will muddle its way through out of that. And, and to what extent does the United States, is the United States exerting any influence? I mean, it seems to me that the relationship between the United States military and the Egyptian military is a pretty tight one. And uh, yet I've, I've really seen virtually no reporting as to uh, what extent the, uh, the, the U.S. has any influence on that military. I mean, we, we give them quite a bit of money. <laughs> and, um, and, and to what extent the U.S. has, at least in terms of back channels, any type of opinion as to what's going on. Well, yeah, it's very difficult to know what U.S. policy is. And there are all kinds of rumors. In, in Egypt itself, the secular uh, upper middle classes have decided that uh, the Americans wanted the, the fundamentalists in. Yeah, and that well, I don't understand that. I this. saw that reporting. I, I, I don't understand yeah. that. What, why, what, why would they think that? And is, is that true? 
No, it's not true. All you have to do is is be around Washington to know that. Uh, I mean, Congress Congress people basically have a, a heart attack if you mention the Muslim Brotherhood in front of them. Uh, the U.S. My understanding is, is Michelle Bachman. Uh, we have audio that we're going to be playing later in the program today. My understanding is Michelle Bachman is convinced that the Muslim Brotherhood has completely infiltrated our government. Yeah, yeah. They, they have all the Americans have all kinds of conspiracy theories, or they think it's Al Qaeda or, or whatever. It's not. You know, it gave up violence. But um, uh, th- th- there are all these conspiracy theories. Here's what I think. I think the Obama administration would would much have preferred if the Mubarak government had continued because Mubarak was uh, a lapdog of the United States, and it did whatever the United States asked it to do. Uh, and so, um, but once you had these millions of people on the street, and it became obvious that Mubarak uh, couldn't survive, uh, they, uh, they switched horses, and they, uh, they supported the, the, the revolution. But, you know, they don't, the, the U.S. has interests, and they don't, want to, they don't want their interests damaged, so they don't want anything to happen that would uh, affect the peace treaty with Israel. Uh, they don't want the Egyptians uh, um, uh, ceasing to put pressure on Hamas through blockading uh, the, the Gaza population. Uh, they, they, uh, they don't want the Egyptians making up with, uh, with Iran, uh, and so on and so forth. And they're not getting everything that they want, and the Brotherhood, you know, is is a real fly in their ointment. I, I, I'm, I'm sure that that the Obama administration was rooting for Ahmed Shafiq, the uh, the establishment candidate, to win, uh, but uh, he didn't. And uh, the the Obama people are, are relative realists, and so I think they're afraid that if the military is perceived as cracking down too hard, as being too dictatorial, as going back too much to the Mubarak practices, uh, that it will cause a, a revolution part two, a social explosion, uh, which will be very unpredictable and could well bring to power people who are very, very hostile to the United States. So far, uh, the revolution has worked out in a way that doesn't really badly affect American interests. So I think they don't, they don't want the, the, the military going off the reservation. And I don't think the military does what they ask it to do. I th- I'd be very surprised if if um, if the Obama administration was in favor of dissolving parliament or of uh, uh, military uh, the military issuing a constitution and so forth. But um, I think the Egyptian military, although it gets a lot of money from the United States, doesn't really need that money. You know, we overestimate what we do for the Egyptians because. Uh, the, the, the money the Congress gives to Egypt actually is in the form of um, a military aid, uh, but that mostly goes to American arms corporations. Right. Uh, and then the, the helicopters and so forth are delivered to the, to the Egyptians, but they don't have a need for that much hardware. They've got warehouses, apparently, full of tanks and helicopters. And they don't even know how to operate a lot of that stuff. It's just building up. They're not at war with anybody. Well, they can't be at war with Israel because Israel has an atomic bomb and would wipe the map with them. And, and so they don't, just don't need... That's not a leverage on them to say, well, we're not going to send you any helicopters this, this year. You know, I don't think that they, they really care. Uh, so I think that they're, they're acting pretty high-handedly, and, I, and, and the evidence we get from the press, at least, on the surface is that uh, Leon Panetta calls up uh, uh, Field Marshal Hossein Tantawi, the, the military head, and uh, and says, you know, Hossein, you know, cool it, you're going too far, uh, and uh, tries to get them to back down a little bit. Interesting. Well, uh, Professor Cole, I appreciate your spending the time with us, and um, hopefully we can uh, we talk to you again after parliamentary uh, uh, elections. But I mean, on balance, it seems. You know, like like I say, I you know I had a very different perspective on this to hear the uh, the prognosticators yesterday, but it, it seems as if the the revolution that took place over the past fifteen, sixteen months, eighteen months in Egypt um, is is doing about as well as one could 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 hope. I mean, in many respects, I mean we've we, we've had uh, very little, relatively speaking, violence. Um, and we still seem to be on a path of, 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 of some form of democracy. Is that accurate? Yes, I, 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 that's, my, that's my impression of it, and uh, I think a very bumpy road and, and lots of dangers, uh, but uh, 
actually this this outcome in the presidential election, given that they dissolved the Muslim Brotherhood Parliament, uh, that the Brotherhood got the presidency at least, uh, uh, and uh, that that there will probably be a cabinet that looks like Egypt, uh, that that uh, uh, that you're not going to go back to the secret police and the, uh, the censorship and all those things that uh, I think Shafiq might have represented. I think this this is a, a relative win uh, for the revolution, and uh, I'm, uh, the Egyptians uh, that I talk to, at least, uh, and I, I talk to a really wide range of them, uh, are, are relatively optimistic. Uh, the, you know, the, the dark cloud is the economy. Uh, the economy is not coming back the way they want it to, and uh, these things that are happening, the big demonstrations and uh, the dissolution of parliament, the instability, you know, is, is, is scaring the tourists away, and the tourists are uh, a really huge part of the Egyptian economy. Uh, so I, I think if the, the sooner you can get a constitution and a parliament and a functioning government uh, that, uh, you know, just goes on from there, uh, the sooner things will settle down and uh, people can get back to work. Fascinating stuff. Professor Juan Cole, uh, informed comment at juancole.com. Thanks so much for joining us.